Okay, everybody. So welcome to the IECS seminar. My name is David Sondag. I'm a lecturer in computational science here at IECS. And for those of you who might be new to the seminar but haven't been here before, uh, the IECS seminar is built so that we can invite leaders in computational and data science to give talks about their research. Um, one logistical note is that um, starting, so this is the second to last seminar of the, of the semester. In two weeks on November 15th, Francisco Forster Barone will give a talk titled The Universe in a Stream, Challenges and Progress of the Alerce Broker. So uh, that'll be the last one for the semester. And you're all welcome to come to that as well. So today I'm very delighted to introduce Bob Moser from UT Austin. Bob is the holds the WA Tex Moncrief Junior Chair in Computational Engineering and Sciences and is a professor of mechanical engineering and thermal fluid systems. He is also the director for the Center for Predictive Engineering and Computational Sciences, the PECO Center, and he's the deputy director of the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at UT Austin. Bob conducts research on the modeling and numerical simulation of turbulence and other complex flow, flow phenomena, and he's been a leader in the use of direct numerical simulation for investigating and modeling turbulent flows. Uh, he's got a broad background in, in research, uh, a lot of different applications such as re-entry vehicles, solid propellant rockets, micro-air vehicles, and the human cardiovascular system. So that kind of spans a lot of different application areas. Um, he is a fellow of the American Physical Society, and he was the awarded the NASA Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement. So um, I will invite Bob up here. He's, he's a great guy to uh, have with us today, so uh, enjoy that. Thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, thanks everyone for the uh, opportunity to speak to you and uh, the invitation to come uh, come visit the department. Um, I, <clears throat> I want to talk today about wall bounded turbulence. And it's uh, actually I've been working on it in this area for uh, since I was in college. It's one of these things where, where I never stopped doing your thesis. Um, but uh, and and. You know, talk about, I want to tell you about what we can able to learn about, uh, about the wall down material uh, from direct numerical simulation, for those who are not familiar. That's basically solving the Darby equations for fluid dynamics uh, for all the details of the material. So, uh, I believe the negative stress equations, this is uh, what, uh, what turbulence does. So, um, <coughs> I'll start by talking a little bit about wall bounded turbulence and the background and how we see just to give you a uh, taste of what this actually is called. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, which would it be? Oh, OK. Wait, who is this? Oh, wait, who is this one? This one. Well, this is this one. OK, so um, I want to uh, acknowledge my uh, co-author, Nguyen Kyu uh, Lee. Former student and postdoc of mine, who is, of course, the one who did the earlier one. Didn't want to, didn't want to uh, skip that. So, I want to tell, talk a little bit about the turbulent, uh, well known turbulence, and how we see that. Then we'll go on to actually what we may have learned from the, from the, uh, uh, from the simulations, and, uh, and, and I'll make a few comments at the end. Uh, but also, I might point out the, uh, I took the acknowledgments here at the beginning, because I always forget to. Yeah. And uh, the top one is for the for the, uh, resources to support the people, uh, uh, both most of them. Thank you. Uh, but also, but the bottom three are for computer time, and it takes a lot of time. So, so that's uh, so. What about the turbulence? Uh, well, turbulence occurs in fluid flows all, all the time. Uh, well, many of the technological uh, uh, and natural systems that we, that we are concerned about. Uh, involve turbulent flow, and they involve uh, you know, those flows interacting with solid surfaces. Uh, and so going from left to right, we are increasing in, in the Reynolds number. That means that we're, <coughs> we're making the viscosity less important uh, and the, and the uh, inertial effects more important as we go from left to right. And when we get into the middle here, this middle region, yeah, this middle region, can you see the uh, in this middle region, we're starting to get to the Reynolds numbers uh, where we actually care about. 
there was a Reynolds numbers that are uh, of industrial uh, importance. And um, it's been a real challenge to be able to simulate uh, the tear norms in the by the simulations I pointed out. Um, at, at, at high enough Reynolds numbers to get into the model. And the simulation we want to talk to you about have, have, have done that. Of course, we go, we go to higher and higher, in, for example, in the environmental and atmospheric uh, turbulence, and the Reynolds numbers get much higher. And uh, at least our current understanding of what I'm going to show you today suggests that uh, there's a path to extrapolate these results to a higher So uh, I'm going to talk about that, but I just want to point that out. Okay, just to, just to set the, the stage for those of you who are not familiar with the, uh, with the intricacies of wall value treatments, um, it's a multi-scale phenomenon. Uh, and that multi-scale phenomenon arises because if you're very close to the wall, uh, then it, it turns out that viscosity is very important. Whereas if you're, if you're <coughs> way far away from the wall, viscosity is not important. And that, uh, that uh, introduces a different scaling to the way things um, There's a, a, a near wall, <coughs> there's a near wall scaling uh, with, with length scale delta mu here, which, uh, which is, uh, the length scale is formed from the wall shear stress and the viscosity. And <coughs> then there's an outer layer scaling which has to do with the thickness of the layer. And so the fact that you have these two scaling results in, in different uh, scalings between these two regions and importantly, in the middle, there's an overlap. So we do a multi-scale asymptotic analysis about how that works. And there is this overlap region. And, that, and the consequences of that, oh, I'm sorry. The consequences of that are, are actually pretty important. We'll talk about that. So as I said, the wall shear stress is, is one of the uh, key um, um, uh, scaling variables and, and viscosity for the near wall. And then uh, also, Okay, so just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, here is a visualization of, of, of the flow between two parallel walls. We call it a channel flow. <coughs> and that's the type of flow that we can see. The, what you're looking at is a colored representation of the streamwise velocity, the velocity from uh, the left to the right. Uh, the, you can see the walls here are, are on the boundaries and top of the bottom. And <coughs> you see all these uh, structures here. This, this, uh, this low one here is the friction Reynolds number, we call it the friction Reynolds number of 180. And, um, and you can see all this uh, behavior, of, uh, this, uh, this complicated um, uh, uh, complicated structures uh, that, that appear here that, uh, <coughs> that arise because of the, of the presence of the world. As we go to a, a higher Reynolds number, increase the Reynolds number by about a factor of, I guess about a factor of and, um, and then those structures that we saw there have now become much smaller. They're still there, but they're way down, uh, you know, sort of smaller than the size of the area. And so they've actually become five times smaller. We go <coughs> to five times higher Reynolds number, to about 5,000, uh, and, uh, and, it, and it happens again. It gets smaller again. You can't even see uh, in this picture sort of the analog of these guys because they become so small. At the same time, then this outer region has gotten much more complex. So this outer outer turbulent flow is the part of the flow that scales with the outer scale. In this case, the size of the channel. You can see that that sort of there are these large scale variations that occur over the over the top of width of the channel. Uh, and then there are things that are happening much much smaller, uh, and that goes with the scale. So that so it's this region in between that actually turns out to be very interesting. <coughs> that both are part of the So here's another view of the same thing. We're looking at the uh, on the sides. This is a, a, a view of these channels. The side uh, is the streamwise velocity again, and the top uh, is a, <coughs> a visualization of the local wall shear stress. And in the streamwise direction, which is along, I'm sorry, is along this way, you can you can see that things are, are long and streaky, and that's a characteristic of wall bounded turbulence. They have this near wall streakiness, but uh, as you go to a higher Reynolds number, that one was the 180. This is a five times higher Reynolds number. That streakiness is still there, but it's at a much smaller scale. And uh, it's hard to see it in this, uh, in this visualization. But you can see that there are some 
you know, some agglomerations that have some street construction that are on a much larger scale than the streets, which are which are down by the big sea. If I go to the next highest Reynolds number, um, the color seems to change a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, again, this, this is the streamwise velocity and this is the little shear stress. You can't see, uh, you can't see these uh, little streaky bits at all. Uh, because they, the, the size of them scales with this inner length scale, this wall length scale, based on the wall shear stress and oh, viscosity. Yeah. Which way is the flow? Oh, the flow is going, going this way. I'm sorry, this way. Okay. I'll point that. Okay. Like this. <laughs> so, so this is so it's a true multi-scale phenomenon. Yeah. Are we looking at a simulation or data or whatever? It, it is data from a simulation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, everything I'm going to show you, almost everything I'm going to show you is from a simulation. And I'll let you know when it's from, from uh, a spread out of Now, um, to give you an idea of, of what it takes to do these simulations, um, this is a, a, a little chart that shows the history of these, of these, uh, uh, of the, channel flows of this type that we simulate over the years, back from when I was a graduate student, uh, you know, actually this is a little bit after I was a graduate student, but uh, down here, this is on uh, our tab 180, uh, all the way to now with, uh, with uh, Lee. And, um, and so we've been stepping along, and as the, you know, as the computers have become bigger and bigger and harder and harder to use, we've been able to go to higher and higher. You know, so, that, so that's what we've been able to do. And, um, and you might ask uh, whether it makes sense to do this. Because we're, what we're doing is we're spending an awful lot of computer time, I'll give you a sense of that in a minute, uh, to do these simulations. And even when we did them, did them back, uh, back in the day, <coughs> um, it was an awful lot of computer time then on the computers that we were doing. We were using a substantial fraction of the largest computers in the world uh, over a period of you know, almost a year to do simulation that we did down here, and more or less the same, you know, substantial fraction of the largest computers in the world over a value year. So that's, that's, um, uh, that's basically how much it costs to do these things, <laughs> and, and actually at each step. So, um, so the question is, does it make sense to do that? Um, that's a lot of resources that are being applied. And, uh, and I argue that, in fact, it does, obviously. And the reason is that we have uh, a, an exceptionally good description of what a fluid does, uh, the navier stokes equations. And uh, it's been uh, uh, well established that on, on, uh, for normal fluids, this is an extremely uh, reliable representation of what the fluid does, including the details of the materials. And so because we have this highly reliable theory to describe the turbulence, uh, or to describe the fluid flow, including the turbulence, it makes sense to expend the resources to solve these equations on the computer uh, to allow us to learn something about the, about the phenomenon. The so these, this, these are the equations that we solved uh, in a funny, uh, in a funny uh, nomenclature of these H's here for the convective and the But um, I've, I've done that uh, to give you a sense of how we actually solved them. So this is the incompressible natural source equations. It turns out that there's annoying features of them with regard to how we solve them, which I won't go into. But we can alleviate those free features for this simple geometry by, uh, uh, by manipulating the equation. We take the curl of the equations and we get an equation for, for the vorticity. Uh, and, we, and we focus in on the vorticity component normal to the wall. And if we take the curl twice, and again take the component normal to the wall, we, we can develop an equation for the Laplacian of the velocity. And these equations are, are, are it turns out, much simpler to solve. Uh, we no longer have to impose the continuity constraint. That, that gets done that out automatically. And the pressure has been eliminated, which is one of the things that's done. So we solved this set of equations. This is actually a, a formulation that we developed back in, in, in the 80s. And it's still the best way to solve this particular problem. So we solved this set of equations, these, these two equations. Uh, and then we use the solution for those equations to, to essentially to cover the velocity through these equations. Um, the, uh, the pre uh, as I said, the pressure is gone. We do a, a, a we solve these in a, with a Fourier representation. 
uh, in, the, in the directions parallel to the wall. And we use a least spline representation of the direction. So, so that's, the, that's the case. That's what we're, we're solving. Um, to actually do that on a modern computer is a, kind of a complicated thing. Um, where these are, uh, to, uh, you'll see in a minute that the calculations are extremely large. Uh, we use, have to use a, uh, a very large multi-processing computer with, um, on the, we use on the order of 500,000 cores to do these simulations. And, um, uh, and the, the process to, to do that uh, involves manipulating the data a lot. We're in, we have to transpose the data a lot in, in, able to, in order to uh, effectively do these computations. And uh, that transpose involves transposing things on the individual uh, nodes of the supercomputer, as well as communication amongst them. And so, so basically, we have to line things up in the x direction. We have to line things up in the z direction. And then we have, later, we have to line things up in the y direction to do different parts of the calculation. And then we just go round and round doing that, uh, you know, transforming it one way and then transforming it back, doing the calculations, doing 48 transforms along the way, uh, uh, as, this, as shown here, and finally doing a bunch of linear algebra over here to solve the negative situations, doing nonlinear products over here to compute the numbers. So that, that's basically what's involved. We time-step the negative surface equations using an implicit, explicit uh, scheme, an ex, uh, so-called INEX scheme, uh, based on a low storage uh, third-order memory cut. So that, that overall is how it's done. Now, to give you an idea of what's, what's expensive here is that you know, we spend about 20% uh, of the time doing Fourier transforms. We spend about 20% of the time doing the linear algebra to solve the negative surface equations. And then we spend 60% of the time shuffling the data. That includes both shuffling the data around between uh, what we call nodes, on, on the communication fabric, uh, fabric, and shuffling the data around uh, within memory. And so that's a lot of shuffling. Um, but that's, that's what it takes. Uh, and then, as it turns out, when we're, when we're doing the uh, for, when we're doing this Fourier transform work in the solving the negative surface equations, um, we're also um, limited by how fast the memory is. The reason we have to spend all this time is because the memory is slow. Um, these, uh, if we had infinitely fast memory, these calculations would be much faster. They'd be about five times faster before you transform to memory and the, the uh, linear algebra. Because we're spending about 80% of the time uh, when we're doing this, moving memory from, uh, moving data from memory to the the process. So the, the entire, all that's complicated about solving this on these big computers has to do with, with managing and optimizing moving data. We, we, we say in this business that in this context, flops are free. Actually, floating point operations are not less expensive. It's moving the data that's expensive. And that actually impacts the way we structure our codes and actually impacts the way we, the details of the data. Okay. So, Another thing that's complicated about this is not all these supercomputers are made the same. Um, here, are, uh, here are the same code uh, each uh, on a number of different supercomputers that, have the, uh, that, that we benchmark. And we're asking the question, how well can we scale this problem up? So how, how well can we use more and more processors to solve it? And, um, and this, is, this is a so-called uh, strong uh, scale. And, um, and we see uh, if uh, these dashed lines, they are sort of the ideal behavior. They, they represent, okay, if, if, I, if I can solve the problem, say here, on 100 uh, processors, and then um, uh, go to, I guess this is about uh, 2,000 processors, uh, then you know, the time that's required should go down by about, about a factor of 20. And in fact, you can see here, that's what this black line is. And that's about what happens on this computer, which is Lone Star 4 uh, out of uh, Texas. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you look at, uh, say, this one, which is the Blue Water Supercomputer at the University of Illinois, uh, which, uh, which at the time was uh, the largest, uh, largest academic supercomputer available, um, uh, it doesn't work very well at all. In fact, the, this scaling behavior is uh, we miss uh, by, uh, I guess, about a factor of three or four 
this, uh, this uh, deficient use of the field. And, and actually, if we scaled this up to the size of the problem we actually needed to do, it would have just gotten worse and worse. This, this pink curve flattens out, while this, of course, keeps going down. And, and we get no, no, nothing more out of the calculation. And it turns out we couldn't have done the calculation we did on this computer. It, would, it wouldn't have. Uh, we spent all our time communicating, we wouldn't ever do it. On the other hand, this, uh, this system, which is the one we actually use, it's a, it's a, a BGQ um, a supercomputer uh, from IBM. Uh, it's the so called Mira system at uh, Argonne National Labs. Uh, it's, this one scales uh, remarkably well, and, and actually, it's a particularly well structured computer for our particular problem. That wouldn't be true for every problem. In fact, many of my colleagues who have to do other kinds of computations, they hated Mira because it didn't work well for them. I hated Blue Waters because it didn't have to work well for us. So, so it, you know, these are all supposed to be general purpose computers, but they're not as general as Blue Waters. And this problem is just getting more complicated as the hardware uh, architecture. So I just wanted to sort of bring that issue up. So back to the actual calculations. We, we did a, a, a bunch of them. Uh, we repeated the, uh, uh, the 180 case that I showed you that, that had been done back in 1987. We did it with some of the other numerics and also a larger group uh, to be consistent with everything with the other. Uh, and then a number of uh, Reynolds numbers up to uh, uh, 5,200, which is our, 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 our flagship here. It's on a domain that is uh, about 24 times the half width long and about uh, about 10 times the half width wide, uh, where the half width is halfway across the channel. Uh, that's what we usually use to measure. And, um, and this, these um, NX and Y and Z tell you how many Fourier modes are required in, in these directions, right? So, so, the, so in the streamwise direction, it required 10,240 Fourier modes. Uh, in the spanwise, 7,680. When you put that all together, this is a huge calculation. To store one snapshot of the, of the, of the velocity field requires, uh, it requires um, uh, about two terabytes two terabytes per snapshot. Um, the find that I just want to point out that we, you know, we have to we have to simulate this for a long time to get statistics. I don't know if you see this over here. Uh, I'll, I'll point to it. Uh, this is uh, this is a particular uh, length scale. So we have to simulate for a long time, and that takes a lot of computer time. Uh, it, in fact, it took 40 million core hours of, uh, of computer time to do the calculation, uh, calculation we're talking about. By comparison, just going down uh, in Reynolds number by a factor of two and a half, this simulation, because the, the cost scale is approximately like the Reynolds number cube, this simulation was essentially free compared to this. In fact, so uh, all of, we, we did this one, that took all the time, and then this was sort of done, all of these were sort of done uh, sort of on the side. They're so small. Okay, so I mentioned that we have this overlap uh, region, and, and the, the asymptotics uh, suggest that the mean velocity should have a quicker structure in the overlap region, and that is that the, that the mean velocity should behave longer. We usually write it this way, with, uh, with the coefficient in front uh, called capital. Y plus here, this plus nomenclature, you'll see it all over the place. That implies that it, the, the quantity is being um, normalized by the near wall uh, units, the units that are based on wall shear stress and viscosity. Uh, and y is the distance from the point. So, uh, so this is what one expects from the asymptotics in this overlap region. And you can see at the various different Reynolds numbers uh, in this log, uh, log linear plot, that it sure looks like it's approximately uh, uh, straight line, so it's approximately long. Uh, we, uh, we can uh, look at that more closely by looking at this quantity beta, which is, um, which is that y times the derivative with respect to y. If the if the velocity is logarithmic, then this will be this will be constant, be flat with the value of y. And and so we plot these same uh, these, these quantities, these same uh, uh, 
Reynolds numbers in, in this form, and we see that all, uh, none of them, even though they look logarithmic, none of them have a flat region except the highest one, already tau 5,000, and it has a flat region over the solidity area. Now, this is by, all, by no means was this guaranteed. Uh, this is an asymptotic result, asymptotic and infinite Reynolds number. So it's not guaranteed that we're going to see a flat region in the planet. But uh, in fact, I was somewhat surprised to actually see it. Uh, but in fact, it does appear to be uh, a very good approximation. Uh, over a region from y plus of about 350 uh, uh, to uh, y over delta of about 0.16. And that, um, that tells you that, that range, this is, this is how you should measure the range, tells you why you don't see it at the lower Reynolds numbers. Because at the lower Reynolds numbers, the higher, the upper bound it's closer to the wall than the lower bound. So there, there is no one. Okay. Yeah. So the y class is normally probably something that involves the No, it, it, it involves it's something that involves the the uh, it involves the wall shear stress. Okay. That, that's and, so and that does depend on that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. So so notice uh, though that this idea that things um, that, that near the wall, uh, things you know, should scale with these plus units is really good. They're all right on top of each other. In fact, the velocity profile is linear in this, in this region, uh, which is curved in, in the bottom. Uh, and that's actually what the theory says. Uh, and then out here is the part that, because we're plotting it in plus units, is the part that is in outer scale, so it doesn't collapse. Out. Okay. So this is another statistical quantity that's interesting, and that is uh, uh, the, the variance of the stream noise velocity, and uh, at various different um, at various different uh, Reynolds numbers. And you'll notice that the, the peak here of this, uh, of this is uh, increasing with Reynolds number. And this uh, is actually currently well well known. This is something that's that's good for uh, experiments as well. Uh, but uh, it, yeah, there's been, it's, been the, it's been the source of a lot of speculation about why. Because the idea that we had that the, that the, the turbulence near the wall should scale like these, with these inner units suggests that, well, that, the, that there shouldn't be this Reynolds number dependence on the peak. And so, so it introduces a really interesting question as to why. Uh, that's a question that, that a number of folks have, have speculated the answer on. Uh, and we, we, I'll show you. Uh, definitively what that what the reason is. Now, uh, there's been some argument, uh, there have been some argument over the years that about whether or not this would continue to, to, to grow forever. And of course, we can't tell. We only go to 5,000. Uh, and in fact, if we plot this, this maximum as a function of the Reynolds number, uh, here are our data. And then these are various experiments. And you see that, that these experiments in a, it's in a pipe flow at Princeton uh, you know, they, they suggest that well, maybe it, it, it doesn't keep going, and uh, and so that was a, uh, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, it turns out though that uh, later experiments, uh, later much more careful experiments that were done uh, reported just last year uh, indicate that going way up to uh, our tau uh, twenty thousand, the uh, indeed this is continuing to grow linearly at the at the rate that, that, that we're seeing. This, this, this data is now completely consistent. Okay, so let's talk. Let's take apart then this little this business about why things are are uh, might be depend on Reynolds number near, near the wall. Even though the idea is that near the wall things should, should uh, we should be able to scale out the Reynolds number of that based on this on this power. So this this is a this is a representation of the spectrum, the energy spectrum. In uh, 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 with wave numbers in the streamwise direction. This is actually this is written in terms of wavelengths. This is wave, wave numbers, and um, uh, this is a, a, a plotted as a function of, of distance from the wall. Okay, so, so we see that there's this big blob here uh, in, uh, in, uh, in wave numbers. I'm sorry, in in, uh, in this range of wave numbers, which of corresponds to this is the streamwise spectrum. Which corresponds to about uh, lambda plus a wavelength of about a thousand, uh, and this is at the higher level. And these these look 
fairly similar, these two blobs, but clearly this outer part is different from the outer part. In fact, this outer part is the key. The fact that there's a blob out here in the outer, this is further away from the wall, there's another peak uh, was formed. That's, that's essentially indicative of the separation of scales between the inner wall. So at R R top 5,000, we're finally at a high enough Reynolds number where we get separation of scales. This is the same thing in the spanwise direction. And uh, there's a couple things I want to point out about this. The same thing happens. We have this big blob that's near the wall. It's at quite, uh, it's at quite uh, high wave numbers, as I say, short wavelengths. Uh, the wavelengths in plus units is about 100, and this is the well-known this is the well-known um, sp spacing of the streets. That we saw. So the streets that we saw, whoops, the streets that we saw uh, are basically encoded here. They're, uh, they're they have a, a spanwise uh, wavelength of about 100. That's the, that's the spacing between the streets, and then they have a, a overall length of about a thousand. That's, that's consistent with. So again, these, these blobs near the wall are about the same, depending on the bounce on it, but we have this outer blob. That's, that's now notice that there's this, there's sort of this uh, oscillating pattern. We have, you know, this isn't just some smooth blob. We have, a, we have something here, we have something here, we have something there. A, there are these uh, you know, uh, regions where they have a, where there's a uh, extensive, uh, 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 there's a strong multiple peaks that have that, that uh, Extend over over basically large distances. That appears to that we first looked at that and we thought, well, that must be this noise, but it appears to be real. And I'll, and I'll show you uh, the consequences of that, of course. But that, that appears to be real. Okay, so to look at this further, it's actually not enough just to look at these one dimensional spectra. So to really see what's going on, we need to look at spectra in the, in the plane. Uh, parallel to the wall, both in, in Kx and in Kz, in, uh, as a function of wavelength and streamlines and streamlines direction. And um, uh, to do that, then, we need a good way to look at it. And I, and I'm, I want to propose to you that, that uh, a good way to look at it and make sure you understand what it is so that we can understand what it is. Now, the easiest thing to do at some, uh, at some wide uh, location would be uh, to say, okay, I've got a spectrum in the streamwise direction, I've got a spectrum in the standwise direction, I just plot them uh, in a Cartesian way uh, in this logarithmic form because we want to use logarithmic because it's such a broad range of scales. So, uh, and that's what, you, that's what you would get here. Now the problem with that is that, it, that um, in terms of understanding how big things are, the, the, uh, the magnitude of the, of the wavelength is uh, or a constant wavelength is one of these colored lines here. So this is, which one? That's the wavelength of lambda plus of 100. It goes right through this blob, because this is near, near the wall, it goes right through, through this blob, because that's what happens with, um, that's representative of the street. But, but you know, it, it, this is, you know, it's not a circle, right? We don't, we're not getting, we're not getting something that, that, uh, that we can clearly see, that clearly makes sense, that okay, these are all the same, these all have the same scale. Also, uh, this black line uh, is, uh, which is at 45 degrees, that represents the line where, where the streamwise and the spanwise wavelength are the same. Okay. Uh, and this, the, this red one shows where the, I guess it's the spanwise wave, spanwise wave, what do I do? What do I do? There it is. The spanwise wavelength is a factor of two, the streamwise wavelength is red, as, as shown over the side here. Uh, those that can, can see it. And uh, the blue one is where the, the um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the opposite. Okay, so, uh, so the fact is that, that these are, this is a line where things are, are uh, the, the waves are oriented at an angle to the streamwise direction. Uh, this uh, in one direction, and this is so this is not this doesn't correspond very well with our understanding of the geometry of the of the spectrum. So we we put together a, 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 an alternative, which we call a polar log or log polar representation, which uh, is a manipulation. It doesn't matter very much, but what, what I, uh, exactly how we do it? That formula is here, but the uh, um, 
the uh, constant wavelength uh, maps now to a circle. So if we, if we look along a circle here, that we, we, we can be clear that those are all things with the same mean scale. And uh, the, uh, uh, the angles, uh, the angle of orientation of the waves is shown by the angle of the plot. So this, is, this will help us understand this. Now what, uh, even in this plot, yeah. So even in this plot, we can start to see that, okay, this is indeed the thing of y plus, uh, the lambda plus of 200, plus the 200 curve. And uh, we can see that it's, that things are, are way smashed up against this axis. That means that things are oriented uh, so that thing, so it's long in the streamwise direction and short in the streamwise direction. So that's what up the whole thing looks like. So these are these this here is the streets. This, this little tail around, uh, here, which is also long in the streamwise direction and uh, 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 short in the streamwise direction, but it's much larger in the streamwise direction than the street, the streets. Um, that's the interesting, that's the interesting thing. And so, in fact, it turns out that's why it's that, the presence of that thing, which is why the streamwise variance, uh, uh, the peak of streamwise variance, depends on the noise. Because you can see that, if we look at this same plot, this is at the place y plus of 15, which is where the peak of that, of the variance is. Um, we can see that uh, at, at the lower Reynolds number, that little tail is in there. Uh, and at, as you go, not, as you go up in Reynolds number, the, the tail becomes bigger and extends over a larger range of states. So it's that bit that's causing that behavior. And, um, uh, and it's an interesting question about why, what, what causes that. And so we'll, we'll talk briefly about that. But uh, what I can do to, uh, to I hope to show you that that's in fact the case is I can go ahead and take the, the data, and I can filter out all the large scale stuff. So this is a, a high pass filter. Uh, everything uh, with scale bigger than 1,000 uh, plus units will be removed. Uh, and so we'll only look at this part, which looks like it's more or less the same at all the numbers. And we can see, uh, here's the streamwise variance that we looked at before. Here is only the small scale part, taking out those large scales. And now that peak collapses. So indeed, that's what's causing it. Uh, these are the large scales. This is the part that uh, has a low pass filter, and you can see it's strongly increased. Um, there's a similar thing. This is the uh, wall normal variance and the and the uh, uh, and the standwise velocity variance, uh, and it doesn't collapse it as well as the streamwise variance. Uh, but the scales it turns out the scales are a little different. But the story is more or less the same. It greatly reduces the, the variability. Okay, so this, this is about what's going on inside, uh, 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 very near the wall, uh, is, is something that actually has, has come to be understood. We, uh, over a number of years, colleagues of, of mine uh, uh, using uh, simulations of what we've been talking about, and have been able to come up with, with a, uh, a picture for what the dynamics are very near the wall. It has to do with streamwise vortices that create these streaks that we talked about. The fact that the streets become unstable and wavy uh, from a hydrodynamic instability. And then that waviness uh, introduces stretching that's, that, that creates a, a strength of the And so there's sort of a cycle that causes that, uh, that causes then making the streets. And that process, uh, that, the importance of that process has been uh, tested in, in, in simulations like what we're talking about by going in and artificially uh, uh, Manipulating the equations to eliminate one or another of these of these processes, and then you find out that the that those those streaks and so go on. Now another hypothesis about what's going on, uh, not just near the wall but much further a wall, is one that's due to Townsend uh, back in 1976. It's called the Cache Dating Pool, and the idea is that those structures that we saw very close to the wall, they, they uh, these are, are supposed to be vertical structures. That's not what I showed you before. But these, vert these vertical structures that, that look close to the wall, low Reynolds number like this, um, that uh, at high Reynolds number, that there's a, there's a high R. And they get bigger and bigger. And bigger, and bigger. This is a so-called cache eddy model. And uh, it actually can be used to make some predictions about what the statistics should be. And, um, and 
This is what those predictions suggest. It suggests that the, the, the U prime, uh, the, the streamwise variance, uh, should have this uh, logarithmic uh, behavior, logarithmic in the, um, uh, the negative uh, slope. And we, to see if that actually is happening, we're looking at this y d by dy thing that, that should be flat when it's not moving. And in fact, there's nowhere where it's flat. So in fact, it doesn't look like this is true. Um, it also makes uh, claims about the, the vertical velocity variance and the, and the spanwise velocity, which is also supposed to be uh, logarithmic. And the spanwise velocity looks like more like this. Uh, I'm sorry. The spanwise velocity looks more like this. Okay. So, so uh, for the spanwise velocity, yeah, maybe this is true. Streamwise velocity. Okay. I want to point out, though, that maybe th that it appears that that again is due to these, to these, um, to this, uh, to the very large scales. Uh, because if I look at uh, if I look at the streamwise velocity of the small scale part. It turned out that this part right here is low. And so it appears that it's the large, these very large scales that are spoiling the, uh, the attached data. So the attached data hypothesis may, in fact, be, be um, uh, a, a good representation of the, of the near wall small scale uh, part, but when it gets to be too large, it, it, it's something else is happening. Okay. So, I showed you what happens as a function of Reynolds number, uh, you know, in these sort of spectral plots. And um, by the way, how, how long do we have? Okay, very good. That's perfect. So um, the uh, uh, if I go further away from wall, the wall, of course, we get rid of this this blob that happened here, which is the near wall streaks. But we have these things, and uh, which are are reminiscent of the tail. In fact, it, it gets smaller and smaller the further away from the wall. I'm talking about here at y plus of 3,000, which is about halfway from the wall to the center of the channel. And, uh, and, it's, and it's very, very concentrated in this, in this wall. That means that it's very streaky with a very wide uh, uh, wavelength. And this is, uh, the wavelength is, uh, uh, that's uh, 100,000, it's 10,000 plus years. It's, 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 it's very, and so the idea is that, that the fact that these things are here is, because, uh, uh, is what causes the tail that we saw in the In fact, these large structures are imprinting themselves. And this is actually an idea that, that Beruzic and, and, uh, and others have, uh, have proposed. And, uh, and the simulations will come actually confirm that. So to get, a, to get at some of this, and, and we could, I could spend you know, a couple hours going through all of this. But we, we can look at the equations that, the, that govern the Reynolds stress, that is to say these variances that we talked about. And, and, and there are terms that represent the production. Sorry. There's terms that represent the production. There's uh, terms that represent transport of, uh, in the direction of the wall. Uh, there's terms that represent um, di redistribution between the various velocity components and dissipation. And I want to just, I, there's a lot here, I just want to point out a few little things on the slides that, that I'm going to show. Um, so th this is the production, uh, the production and the dissipation um, at the various different levels of the And uh, the interesting thing is that out here, the, out in this region, out across the y plus 100, the production is more or less a full dissipation. This is something that people thought for a while, but it's not exactly true. This is the difference. This is the transport part. And, um, this is the, uh, the transport of kinetic energy. And, it, and the higher the Reynolds number actually the further away from production equals dissipation. So that's a modeling nonsense that people use. It's not, it's pretty good, but it's not quite good. Um, that transport uh, term, that, uh, that motion of, uh, of kinetic energy from uh, in Y, uh, is dominated by, by what we call the turbulence. It's, it's due to the turbulence transporting itself. And that's what this term represents. And, uh, and I'd like to go a little deeper into what, the, into what these are. And so in, instead of just looking at that equation that I showed you, we can, we can essentially look at a, 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 a spectral version of that equation. So we can uh, <coughs> scope out what things happen at different scales. So we'll be looking at the same kind of, uh, of, uh, same kind of uh, uh, stuff 
spectras we looked at before, except that now we're, instead of looking at the so spectrum of, let's say, the energy or the streamwise variance, we're looking at the spectrum of the production of turbulence. And you see, uh, near the wall, the production is all in, the, in, this, in this blob that represents the streets. That's what you expect. But there's really no tail in the solution. Uh, and then as we go further out in Y, uh, the production is very much concentrated in, a little, in these little dots. And it turns out that those, that, that concentration in little dots, the location and scale of those little dots, uh, is coherent over a significant uh, distance. And that was, was, was responsible for, those, for that sort of streaky structure in the spectrum. So it looks like there's some sort of uh, discrete changing of scale. That's just an interesting observation. And, but uh, the point is that, the, that we have the production is very tight in these, in these, uh, in these streaky uh, streamwise along. And yet, the dissipation out uh, at uh, far enough uh, already, this is at y plus 1,000, the dissipation of uh, d time, d time w, uh, is, is you know, very close to isotropic. And in fact, it, it's, it's amazingly close. So, so the dissipate, so it's produced in this very, uh, very focused way, but it's, it's broadly uh, dissipated. And so that means that things have to move around, and they have to move around the scale, and they have to move around the And the interest, uh, so, so uh, let me skip that. Uh, let me skip that. Uh, we can take a look at the, the moving, the spectrum of how things move around. The and, and here, the uh, things that are blue are negative. So these are things that are giving up energy. Things that are red are positive, so they're gaining. So this, this is near the wall. And notice this region where the tail is, is gaining energy. And it's, uh, where is it gaining energy from? Well, if you look at different Y locations, it's gaining energy from, you know, from the locations above. This line here is separating where the, where the flux of energy is going toward the wall, that's in this region, uh, from where the flux of energy is going away. And so we see that energy is being deposited in here. So that's what's causing the tail is that there's these big things far away from the wall are, are transferring energy down into, into the wall. That's why it doesn't scale with the with the, with the Okay. Um, scale transfer also has to happen. We have to move from, from, uh, from the places where, in spectral space, where the production happens to places where uh, the dissipation happens. And you see that there's actually, let's look at one of these. This is, uh, uh, y plus of the uh, One of these, uh, this is the region where the production happens, and it's negative, that means it's giving up energy here. Um, and it's gaining en energy over here. So basically, it's more or less of the same scale, maybe a little bit uh, smaller scales. Remember, it's good further out, the scales are smaller. Um, but it's, um, it's mostly uh, changing orientation. It's, it's taking these streaks and breaking them up so that they have orientations other than um, in, the, in the vertical velocity variance uh, uh, right here, uh, we have a, sort of an isotropic uh, transfer of energy from large scales, that's closer in here, it's, it's, it's blue there, to small scales. This is, this is what Tomogorov taught us should happen in, in turbulence, turbulence transport, where things go from, from large scales to small scales. Well, they happen here too. I go from large scales here to small scales, but I also go to the same size scales at different um, there's, there's a question which I'm gonna, I think I will, I will forego answering, having to do with how energy is transferred from one velocity component to another, because it turns out all the production occurs in the stream velocity. Okay? So the question is, how does it get up? There's an interesting story there. It's much more complicated than people have been uh, thinking, which was that the energy came from the streamwise velocity component and then went into the other two. And that would be what you would expect. But it's a more complicated picture. It turns out that uh, I won't show you. We won't go through this. But it turns out that it's, the picture is like this: that things are going all over the place in different in, you know, in different parts of the world. Uh, 
And, and we actually have a we have an idea of why why those things happen in terms of the structure of the chip. So at least you know. Okay, so that so I think I think that's a good place to stop. There's probably more turbulence uh, um, details than you ever wanted to see. But let but let me let me um, I hope I've convinced you that we actually are able to learn uh, some really uh, I guess some, some really um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for intricate details about the way the turbulence works by using these these uh, numerical simulations and with what amounts to uh, some sophisticated data analytics. Um, and this was possible uh, based on the largest supercomputers uh, uh, that were available, and they're becoming increasingly challenging to work with. Uh, the Mira, which is the one we use, has been decommissioned. I'm not sure I can do this calculation today. The code Pumba uh, 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 would need a, uh, uh, actually a major overhaul in order to run it effectively on the next generation. And that's becoming increasingly a problem. So you go from one generation to the next, which is only for years. Our codes to use them effectively end up having to be able to speak. And that's a real problem. Um, the channel flow DNS and R had a high enough Reynolds number to have high Reynolds number effects, and so that's been very uh, useful and important. And the outer layer of turbulence is driven by production uh, in very, uh, uh, very uh, elongated and streamwise direction, very focused uh, uh, range of scales and span structure. We saw that in the spectra, and and then there's a complicated process by which those uh, by which the energy more importantly, or not more important, more interesting or, or more surprising is there seems to be a discrete set of scales, at least in the simulation, at which this production occurs. And why that is, I really don't know. It does seem to be real in this calculation. Uh, we, it, we, uh, there's some, you know, we were concerned that maybe it was an artifact of, of uh, you know, the numerical calculation of the finite box and so forth. But that doesn't seem to quite go well. Uh, but it's probably don't know. So we really don't know why it is that way. It'd be interesting to know if that's really uh, if that's really true and why. <laughs> so so with that, let me let me finish. And uh, I hope I uh, I hope that was an, uh, at least a, an amusing tour through uh, Wall Valley Tour. So thank you very much. Okay. So we'll take a couple questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm surprised you show how many years the algorithm remains the same. So you have to do just for some computer from the same time that 60% of the time yeah. in that movement, but the uh, data mention is missing to add the here it is for a time for this and do it at the speed of the Uh so so first of all, um no, it's a good good question. Um yeah, it it, it actually is it is better than doing it and I, I don't know if any. Um, MK looked into it and you know, estimates were kind of factor of 10 to 1. And, and I, what I'd say is only 60%. That's, that's actually not bad. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the, the other thing is about whether new, new algorithms, in particular, I assume you're thinking, oh, well, perhaps we could not use spectral medicine or to do so transforms and so forth. And, the, the scaling doesn't work for that either. And so um, because we're using uh, uh, because we're using special methods, we're um, you know, conservatively we're saving about a factor of two in the number of degrees of freedom in each direction, okay, which is on the order of a factor of ten for the total of the calculation. Yeah, uh, and then assuming all the rest of the calculations were, you know, were, 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 were you know, just scaled in the same way, um, then that would end up being a 10 times uh, more, more calculation with a, um, uh, so that 40% of the actual calculation now from 400%. So we lose by a factor of four. And that doesn't even account for the fact that we have to solve the equivalent of plus uh, So an elliptic problem that, that does, still doesn't scale that. So, so it, the, the, the data manipulation has to get a lot worse before it makes sense to abandon the spectrum. Okay. Uh, 
same difference. But you, you pay in time scales for stuff, you pay in, in, in solving an elliptic problem. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, maybe next one is, is, is that. That's right. So, uh, yeah, it, but it, it has to get a lot worse before we do it. <laughs> like, by a factor of Scale tran transfer? Yeah. Scale transfer. Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, okay. scale transfer. Oh, right. So it's a transfer of energy uh, through nonlinear processes between the scales. Between from one wave number to another. Uh, so you don't change No, no, the problem. No, it's, it's, it's energy transfer amongst different photons. All right, anything else? much at 2.30 now. So we'll thank Bob one more time and <laughs> thanks for your attention.